Maria Hicks was graduated in 2010 from UNM with a psychology major, and at that point it was called an advertising minor. And, um, and she works for McKee Wallwork, and she'll explain a little bit about how she got her job, and which I think is a really important lesson for all of you. And, uh, um, and she, here's her little LinkedIn blurb. I write, I get paid for it, that fact still to this day blows my mind. I stumbled into the advertising industry by chance as a freelance journalist and was in love at first headline. I can't draw, I suck at Photoshop, but I sure can turn a phrase. And for that, I'm grateful, okay? So, um, and I'm grateful to have Maria Hicks here, and she'll talk a little bit about advertising copywriting and um, then open up the floor. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, I was really excited to be um, asked to come here and talk to you guys because I feel like when I was a student at UNM, I really wished I'd been introduced to it sooner um, than I was, which is my own fault. I'm kind of a, a late bloomer as far as school went. Um, but I really want you guys to realize how exciting an industry it is. Um, as I was introduced, um, I graduated from UNM. Um, I did an internship at McKee Wall Working Company uh, my last semester, and then I continued my internship um, a little further until they hired me, um, which is, uh, I'm really lucky that happened because most copywriters, not all, and most art directors um, who do all the visual stuff for advertising um, get hired after they go to portfolio school. We don't have one of those here, and I wasn't in the position to attend one. So getting hired right out of my internship was really awesome. Um, I freelanced for the Alibi and the IQ. Pour one out for the IQ because it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and that's kind of how I got my foot in the door um, at McKee by sending them those writing samples because I didn't have anything else to show. Um, that's me. That's actually my business card. Um, Hunter S. Thompson once wrote, if you're going to be crazy, you better get paid for it or you're going to get locked up. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I was good at writing, but I didn't want to like be a journalist. I didn't want to write a novel. What the hell else can you do with writing, right? Um, I knew that I, did, I wanted a job that didn't have to, I didn't have to cover up my tattoos, that I could dress really comfortably. This is way dressed up for what I usually wear to work. I'm a Chuck Taylors and t-shirt kind of girl, um, but you guys are special, so I got fancy. Um, and so I found advertising. Um, you guys have a general idea of what copywriting is. Um, traditionally, um, these are like traditional forms of media, billboards. That's a radio in the middle, in case you didn't recognize it. That's a TV, in case you didn't recognize that. And then of course, mobile and um, desktop, which is pretty much the most important thing going on for the future and the current state of advertising right now. Um, at my work, um, we have this thing called 330-300. And it refers to kind of the attention span of your target or the person you're trying to sell your products or services to. Um, three seconds is pretty much a billboard. Um, you're driving probably more than 65 miles per hour down the freeway. You're passing a whole bunch of billboards, and that's pretty much the max amount of attention you're going to get from them um, from your billboard. 30 seconds is about TV, radio, pre-roll. Um, so you have more time to get your message across in those forms. And then 300 is um, what we call experiential. Do you guys know what experiential advertising is? So that's kind of when the person is more involved with your product. Um, let's see, uh, like Red Bull doing their dive, cliff diving competition, that's advertising. Um, yeah, it's fun, but everybody's involved, and you're going to remember their brand because of 
how fun and interactive it was. So that so you have a lot more time to engage your um, your target audience with that kind of advertising. Um, I'm going to go through some of my own examples of each media. Um, I don't know if you've seen these billboards around town. Um, our client is French Funeral and Cremation, which is really awesome in my opinion because I get to write, you know, for death care, which is a challenge in itself because not only do people not want to think about death, um, so we had to figure out a way to get people's attention in a positive way to associate um, French with more of a positive, uh, in a positive light than just the somber death part. Um, so they do something called pre-planning where you can plan your funeral obviously before you die. So we had a little room to be um, a little more humorous with that because you can joke about your own death, you can't joke about someone who's just died, um, but when we're talking to people about their own funeral, we can get a little more relaxed with it. Um, so we have Good Morning, Carpe the End, and the most buzzed about billboard in this series, Yodo. So, um, people either love it or hate it, which is great, because they remember it. With billboards, I think your max amount of words that you can get in there is eight. Any over that, your driver's probably going to not look at it. Um, most billboards you see around town are over that. There's way too much going on. Um, so simple is always really great in advertising, especially when it comes to outdoor boards. Um, radio, we, uh, I wrote the scripts for these um, spots we did for the New Mexico Department of Health uh, trying to get people to quit and we actually hired um, his name escapes me right now but the dad from that 70s show Red is his character I can't remember what his real name is but we actually got to hire him as our voiceover talent and um, the idea behind this campaign was when you quit smoking, you have more time to do other things. Um, in this case, the things were still dangerous, but not quite as smoking dangerous as smoking. So, these were newspaper wraps that went around the Onion. I actually won an award, a pretty prestigious advertising award for these really simple um, headlines. Um, but for the next three headlines, I probably wrote about 50 pages of headlines before I got anything worth even showing to my boss. So the one thing about writing in advertising is you're gonna do a lot of it, pages and pages and pages before you get that one headline that's you know worth it. So you guys are all familiar with the um, onion? I got to go to New York and party, and it was great. So I've been trying to get back there ever since. Um, and then I also write TV scripts. Um, but writing scripts isn't just writing, you know, the dialogue or what's happening on the screen. Um, it's at least it's about eight weeks of thinking, just thinking, thinking about what the storyline should be, thinking about how it should look, thinking about um, just the general concept of the campaign itself. Um, so weeks and weeks and weeks go into thinking about 30 seconds on the screen. Okay, so a little story before this. This commercial um, is also from the New Mexico Department of Health. Um, but what was different about this campaign is we started from the ground up from research targeting Hispanic populations in New Mexico. We really wanted it to be culturally sensitive and accurate. Um, so this was kind of groundbreaking because it's the first in the country to ever do that. Usually campaigns are created in English and then they're translated in Spanish, which completely misses the mark sometimes um, because our cultures are obviously different. 
um, or everybody's cultures are obviously different and we can't blanket our messaging to effectively reach everyone. Um, it's in Spanish, so I'll kind of give you the idea behind the campaign. We hired, um, we found through research that um, smoker, Hispanic smokers uh, really, really, they, they persevere. So they make, they have a lot to overcome, they work really hard, um, and they don't give up. And so the idea behind this spot was perseverance. So we hired um, an Olympic medalist who is a, a Mexican immigrant who lives in Austin. His name is um, Leo Manzano. And we also hired the actual lion that you see on MGM Studios. Se llama Leo Manzano, medallista olímpico, le dicen el león. Y no por ser el más grande, el más fuerte, o por seguir invicto, ya que ha conocido la derrota varias veces. Entonces, ¿por qué lo conocen como león? Simple. Por su determinación y coraje para seguir adelante y perseverar ante todo. Por eso, si has tratado de dejar de fumar y fracasado, no te rindas. Estás un paso más cerca de lograrlo. Marca el 1855, déjelo ya o visita déjelo ya nm.com. Habla con un coach y obtén tu programa personal, parches, pastillas y chicles de nicotina gratis. ¿Qué esperas? We have some such awesome TV. I'm going to go ahead and show you some more. We, one of our clients is St. Louis Children's Hospital in Missouri. Um. I believe in me. Do you believe in me? Here's the deal. I can do anything, be anything, create anything, become anything. Because you believe in me. Thank you. McKee Wall Working Company um, is a local advertising agency here. We are downtown. Um, we have a lot of national and local clients, um, which is pretty exciting because I get to do, I'm never bored. I get to work on you know, children's hospitals and anti-smoking campaigns, jewelry, pizza. I don't know if you guys have seen all the packaging at Dion's. Um, I've done all the stories on the cups and the brownies and the pizza boxes. Um, but before you see all that, um, we have three departments in our advertising agency. We have the creative department, which I'm in, and my art and the art directors are in. We have the media department, who um, gives us our recommendations as to what channels we should be using to get our messaging out. Um, and we have our accounts um, department who is kind of the liaison between uh, the creatives and the client. So I don't have to talk to any clients except for when I'm presenting, which is A-OK -okay with me. Um, and the, the accounts department, they do all the research um, about who we're talking to, um, what kind of ideas we should be sharing through our creative, um, and ultimately if we're on strategy. So they come up with the strategy and they usually um, pare it down to one single word or one single compelling idea, and that is put in a creative brief. So a creative brief is supposed to be one page. It's often more than one page, and it tells you all about your demographic. So Who's most likely going to buy your service or product? What are they like? Um, are they women? Are they men? Are they teenagers? Are they Caucasian? Um, where do they, you know, what's their typical day like? Do they have children? Do they go to school? Do they work, et cetera? Then they tell us what the single compelling idea is. Um, for one of our spots uh, for anti-smoking, it was after you smoke, 
um, your life gets better. And that's where we came up with the Thrive campaign. Have you seen the anti-smoking commercial with the flowers growing out of the ashtrays in the car? That was, came from that creative brief. Um, then we spend, depending on you know, the budget, if we're doing a full-blown campaign, um, we usually have about eight weeks to brainstorm and um, get our presentation to present our ideas ready. Um, sometimes I'll brainstorm alone, but I found that bouncing ideas off of you know, different people is more effective. Um, after brainstorming, I'll sit down and I'll write and write and write and write and write and I'll just get it all out and then I'll edit later. I think a big mistake that writers do is trying to edit while they write and in this step, that's not beneficial. You wanna get all the crap out. You're gonna go through all the horrible cliches and puns and all the crappy stuff that lives in front of your brain has to come out before you can get to the really good stuff. And usually um, by the time you get to the good stuff, it hurts. You don't want to write anymore. You hate your job. You're crying. You're thinking about going back to bartending. Um, and that's when you walk away. And you, and you, you know, go have a beer if you're old enough. Uh, or you think about something else. Or you take, you know, you take a walk. You take a couple days to not think about this thing that you've been eating, you know, sleeping, living for the last few weeks. And that's really when all the good stuff comes is when you're not thinking about it anymore. After you've done all the thinking you think you could possibly do, you step away and it'll just hopefully, ma often magically happen. Um, if you'll read a lot of things about like uh, Steve Jobs and um, other creatives in the industry, they'll tell you the exact same thing. Um, and then after that, we present our ideas to the client um, it's really important to remember that the presentation itself is a is something that you're selling to the client as well. So you want your presentation to be just as creative as your writing and your ideas. Um, if it means presenting outside of the boardroom, if it means putting on a play, if it means um, getting someone uh, who sings opera to come in and, and sing during your presentation, whatever it it is that works well for your concept, um, do it um, because you're selling your, you know, your, your work and that is just as important as the work itself. Okay. I just wanted to show you some of our experiential stuff. Um, so one of our clients is International Paper. They're the parent company, excuse me, of Hammer Mill and some other, I don't, I'm not sure what other big name paper companies are, but um, they make all of the cups and uh, sleeves for Starbucks all over the world. They are the biggest paper company in the world. And they wanted to sell their, um, one of their products, their archi archival paper at a design conference. So it's like a trade show. People have booths, you mill around and you get you know, samples of stuff and you network with other designers. And so we were charged with the, you know, the task of how do we get, how do we make paper exciting at a, a design conference when people are going to have their awesome posters and, you know, other designy stuff that's just a little more exciting than paper itself. So this was our answer. How Design Conference, the largest gathering of artists and designers in the world, and where international paper showed up to reestablish its relevancy in an ever-growing paperless society. The world may be moving to digital, but most great ideas still begin on paper. So we took one digital idea back to where it all started, Meet Senseless Drawing Bot One. Creating random graffiti art on the wall of archival paper, it showcased the product and posed the question, can something mindless create art? By posting a photo of our food to Instagram with the hashtag 
IP booth. Attendees vied for one of the bot's 40 signed posters and invited them further into our conversation. On the first day of the conference, Instagram shut down our account due to its rapid surge of engagement, believing us to be spammers. By the third and final day, we had stolen the show, proved paper was here to stay, and given designers something deeper to talk about. So, what I want to stress is at the end of the day, I'm the writer. I need to be able to do it well. I need to be able to, my grammar has to be impeccable, my spelling has to be impeccable. Um, but on top of that, more importantly, I'm always a thinker. Um, all of us are always thinkers. Um, everyone's job at the agency is to be creative in everything that we can do. Um, so we're idea makers before we're actual, I'm an idea maker before I'm an actual word executor. Um, and I think that's the most important thing that I can get across right now. Um, so I was talking about Dion's packaging. And they didn't have a lot of money. Um, they just wanted us to reskin their pizza boxes and their cups. Because they always have Christmas packaging, right? Um, and Dion's big brand identity is connection. They don't want to just serve you good food. They want to create a space for families and friends to connect. Like, I, do you notice that when you go to Dion's, you're not hurried out. You can stay as long as you want in a booth and hang out with your friends, even if you just ordered a Coke. They're never going to rush you off because they like that feeling of comfort that people get from Dion's. So we were like, how can we get across connection in our holiday packaging? Um, we always want to go above and beyond what just the client asks us to do. Um, so we had this idea that we would put, um, we would print mistletoe on the bottom of each cup. And then on the cup, we wrote, at Dion's, we believe there's no such thing as mistletoe. Have you guys read this before? No? OK. Sadly, we've noticed it's not always around when you need it most. So to make sure you're never caught with lips poised to pucker and this Mary Berry nowhere to be found, we've put one on the bottom of every cup. Just raise it in the air for a holiday toast and sneak a Christmassy kiss when that lucky someone least expect it, expects it. Don't forget to snap a pic or video <coughs> and share it with us too. And then we put the hashtag Merry Christmas. And people would take their pictures and then it was all over the internet. So we got the consumer to do a lot of the legwork for us. Because these cups only go so far, um, but when there's a buzz about them, they go all over the world on the internet. Um, so I kind of went over the process earlier. Um, creative brief, brainstorming, writing, self-loathing, more writing. Um, Finessing. Um, so at a certain point, um, when you first start out as a copywriter, you're going to be talking to your creative director, who's your boss. He's in charge of the creative, creative department a lot. You're going to be in his office. He's going to be um, telling you what's good, what isn't. Um, a good creative director is going to mentor you. And I was lucky enough to have um, a very good mentor. Um, when you kind of get more experienced, um, I don't have to do that so much um, unless it's there's a lot writing on um, something in particular. Um, then we get the client's approval. And then fist bumps, inflated egos, tears of joy, which is all worth all of that self-deprecation that came before. And then you get back to work. Um, sounds hard. Yes, it's really hard. My job is. Um, is difficult, but it's challenging, and, and it's so worth it. It's so much fun. Um, so how do you become a copywriter if you're interested? Well, you should graduate. Um, these are in no particular order either. I was a non-traditional student. Um, I graduated when I was 28 um, after going to another college in Colorado, dropping out bartending for a long time, following bands around the country, and basically 
trying to be 21 forever. I thought I could live that way, and then I got sick of it. <laughs> and I was, went back to school. Um, like I said, I wrote uh, for IQ, for um, The Alibi. I wrote for myself. I wrote lyrics. Just write. Write a journal. Write a blog. Um, write scripts. Um, don't write your friend's ter term papers, but do write a lot. Um, also read a lot, because um, the best writers that you can learn from have probably been published. Um, and reading's fun. And you can uh, kind of get the viewpoint of maybe a future target audience um, by reading about it. Because you might not be able to you know, go to London and you know, eat their fish and chips. You know, maybe you would have to have a London fish and chip client in the future. You never know. Um, do a lot. I wrote a blog. You can find it um, at mckeewalwork.com. And it's titled The Portfolio School of Life. Um, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I didn't have the opportunity to go to portfolio school. It's usually. Um, there's a good one in Atlanta. There's some in New York. Um, you usually get your master's degree. So if you're really interested in advertising, I would really recommend doing that because um, they kind of prep you um, to be a copywriter and art director way more quicker than I did trying to figure it out for myself. Um, if you can't, don't sweat it. There's other things that you can do to become a good copywriter, um, which includes doing a lot. So become a yes man or a yes woman. Do things that you're not interested in. Do things um, just for the sake of learning about stuff. Um, like I said, I wrote a blog post about <coughs> all the things I learned not going to portfolio school that helped me become a good copywriter. Um, and I think I have a quote from it. I think one of your successes of a writer is um, when people quote you later on. Um, that hasn't happened yet, so I'm going to quote myself. <laughs> Experiences, both the epic, life-changing ones as well as the little fleeting ones, are fodder for creating a brand story or peering into the brain of a consumer. So go to that six-year-old's flamenco recital. Pick a country you know nothing about and go there on vacation. Say yes to jumping out of a plane even if every hair on your body screams no, unless, of course, the pilot looks like a carny and the plane is leaking some sort of fluid. Your ideas and your career will thank you for it later. So education, the education of a copywriter is, um, it never ends. Because I try to do everything. Like on my lunch hour, I'll try to go to that um, art gallery or museum or the rock climbing gym or the batting cage or just something that I a haven't done before haven't seen before or I haven't done in a long time um, the world is your school really in advertising um, if you are really interested in becoming a copywriter I am looking for an intern right this very minute um, our website, masochistswanted.com, will tell you exactly how to apply. Um, and our office is super fun. Um, a lot of, we work as, we work, we play as hard as we work. Um, it's kind of necessary when you do what we do. We have, you know, a guitar and an amp set up. We've got a pet turtle. If you're not sold already, his name is Shelly. He's real sweet. And um, we're always doing things that aren't seemingly related to advertising, but always end up being completely related to advertising. So that said, I may have wrapped up a little early, but if you guys have any questions, please, please ask. I hope that I got across just how exciting my job is. Anybody? Yeah. How much does a typical ad campaign cost? It's completely across the board. Um, it depends on if they just want a newspaper ad. Um, it depends on which newspaper. And is it a national newspaper? Or is it just regional? Or sometimes you can target um, the ads that you'll see 
in a, say, cosmopolitan here aren't necessarily going to be the same ads that the same issue is being read in New York City. Um, so you can target your advertising pretty specifically. Um, it depends on the client. It's really, I really cannot accurately answer that question because it's such a broad answer. Um, it can be in the millions, it can be in the thousands, low thousands. So, yeah. How much do you usually get paid? Um, that's worked into the budget. It completely depends. Um, I know how much we charge for my services. It doesn't necessarily reflect on my salary because my salary can go up, but my what we charge is going to stay the same. Um, we charge about 150 an hour for everything we do. That's writing, that's art direction, that's production, like um, you know, recording talent, um, researching. Um, what I love about working at a small agency, there are really big agencies. Maybe you've heard of Wyden and Kennedy. They did the. Uh, I'm on a boat campaign, um, or BBDO. Um, those are huge, huge agencies that usually have several branches across the country and the world with thousands and thousands of employees. And when you work at those big companies, you're most likely working on one client. So um, I've had friends at those agencies just work on Lexus day in and day out. And they have what are called retainers. For big brands that have a lot of money, they give you a certain amount of money per month, and you just do lots of stuff for them. So they give you a big chunk of money and tell you to roll, you know, just run with it. Um, here, being in New Mexico, we're kind of limited to small agencies. But I really think that I'd rather work at a small agency because I get to work on everything. I get to work on so many different kinds of products and services. I get to um, do pro bono work. Um, which I'm sure big agencies do too, but they're not that really passionate about it, I don't think. Um, What's pro bono work? Please? Ah, that is work that you're doing for free. So typically it's for charities um, or um, you know people that can't really afford your services, but we really um, are passionate about what they're doing as well and we want to help them. Uh, maybe it's stuff for our own community. Um, I really feel like the work that I'm doing is um, kind of making the world a little bit of a better place. Even if it's just making the advertising world a better place, because there's a lot of bad advertising out there. So, did you have your hand up? Yes. Um, when you're doing an ad campaign for a company, how much information do they give you, or do you just come up with everything on your own, as far as like what angle are you learning about? Well, the account team, um, they do all the research, um, who the client is, what kind of products or services they, they're selling, what their problems are, like why aren't they doing so well if they're not doing so well, um, what their past advertising approach has been, um, who, you know, the demographic that we're targeting. Um, so they gather all that information for me, and then they come up with the strategy and I, my job is to create advertising in campaigns that are on par with that strategy. Um, like for Dion's um, team gathered all the information about pizza and they tried other people's pizza. And they did, it's, it's a really kind of a, the anthropology aspect of advertising is they do all the human research and the human um, data gathering and then they tell us we really think that we need to communicate how Dion's um, connects people so that was their strategy and what can we create um, in a compelling way to show people that Dion's connects you to your loved ones as well as you know over pizza so. who is your target um, I mean there's a concentrated target who we can identify and we kind of give her a name and all that. And then, you know, it gets broader and thinner. Um, but our, uh, Dion's target is a 
25 to 45 year old mom um, who works, drives her children to soccer practice, is extremely busy and uses her cell phone, her smartphone all the time to kind of organize her life. And that's our main target. Quite specific. Yes, um, but not restrictive, yeah. terribly restrictive, because I like Dion's too, and well, I guess I am that target. So. <laughs> <laughs> I never put myself in the mom demographic because I'm, you know, weird. But yeah. How do you know if your at twenty eight will fail versus two? We try to measure everything as much as we can. Anything digital online is trackable and measurable. Um, people volunteer to have this machine hooked up to their TV. Um, they're paid, so it's not actually volunteering, but you can track your TV. Um, sales of um, the product or service can kind of gauge whether your campaign's been successful or not. So there's lots of different ways to measure. and. We measure as much as possible, but there's certain things that you just can't. Like word of mouth is super powerful. Um, and there's no really way you can measure that. So I think an important thing to take out of your question is don't only try and formulate your advertising into measurable tactics because you may be missing out on a you know a bigger a bigger thing. I saw a hand over here. Having a background in psychology help you? Actually, it helps a lot. Um, I kind of can understand people's thinking a little bit more. Um, psychology, I think, is just, an, it's just another section of anthropology, the study of humans and the way they think and their behaviors. Um, actually, there was an evolutionary uh, psychologist professor here, Jeff Miller, and he teaches evolutionary psychology, and he's written a book called Spent. And it's all about how, all about the mind of a consumer and why we make the purchasing decisions that we make. And that blew my mind, and I ate it all up. And um, it's actually extremely beneficial. What was also beneficial uh, was all my years of bartending and just meeting people. Um, I, I met a lot of different people in different kinds of bars that I worked at. I worked at a nightclub, I worked at a restaurant, I worked at um, Launchpad for a really long time. So I kind of just knew people and I was able to garner from my experiences and kind of get in the mind of who my target might be. So psychology is really helpful and it's interesting. So just why do people make the decisions that they make? when they buy things. Um, why, when all signs point to yes, do they not buy when you think that they're going to? So I think it's a great thing to have in your back pocket. I kind of, at first, just kind of observed kind of overview of what everyone, what people did there. I didn't really know what went on in an advertising agency. So I watched people. Lucky for me, the creative director at the time um, took me under his wing and kind of taught me all the ins and outs of, of copywriting. Um, I was really lucky to have his mentorship. Um, and he made me write more when I didn't want to write anymore. And he kept pushing me. Um, and I just was allowed to participate. I actually got to brainstorm on real campaigns when I was an intern. Um, so I'd say don't be quiet in the corner. Um, offer to help. Ask what you can do. Ask if you can watch. Ask if you can go to that TV shoot and just observe. Um, being vocal, I think, is um, a sign that you're taking charge of your own career, and that looks really good, and it helps you learn more than you would if you didn't. Thank you, Maria.